Welcome, and thanks for attending today's webinar on FMLA and employee benefits. I'm Cynthia Stribling, Vice President and Training Director for Keenan, and I'm going to be serving as your host today. As noted on the earlier slide, the audio for all of your phones is muted. Um, in case you were wondering, we have about 428 people on this call. So we want to be sure to keep background noise to a minimum and provide the best quality audio for you. We're going to cover our topic today in about 50 minutes, with time planned at the end to, end to address questions you may have on the topic. As they arise, please send me your questions by using the chat feature at the bottom right of your screen, and we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we have time for. We are recording this webinar. We're going to be making it available on the Keenan website within the next week, along with the slides, which you'll be able to download and print. Today I'll be talking with Amy Donovan, Assistant General Counsel for Keenan, on a topic that generates a lot of questions from our customers. As employee benefits consultants, we have found that nowhere is there more confusion than that involved in how to administer employee benefits when employees take various types of leave. Leave is a difficult topic to talk about because it involves the coordination of so many and various federal and state laws. And the questions listed here are just a sampling of the most commonly asked questions that we get every day. Before we get into before we get into a discussion of the questions, I'm going to ask Amy to give us an overview of the laws that are involved in pardon me, of the laws that are involved with employee benefits for employees on leave. So Amy, I'm thank you to all to you. Great. Thank you. And thank you to everyone who's participating in the call today. Um, before we um, start to answer these questions listed here, I wanted to do a brief review of what laws we're talking about. And I have to say that this is not an exhaustive list. There are many laws, um, state laws especially, um, that we won't have the time to cover today, but these are the major ones. Um, in 1980, California was actually in the vanguard of disability leave law and pregnancy disability leave law when we passed the California Pregnancy Disability Leave Law. Um, in 1992, um, um, I'm sorry, California also, um, again, in the vanguard, passed the California Family Rights Act, which gave um, uh, broad rights for family leave and also for bonding leave uh, for parents with new children. Um, that law was followed up a year later by the federal government in passing the Family and Medical Leave Act of 1993, which you're, I, I hope, at least all passingly familiar with at this point. Later that same year, California amended the California Family Rights Act, which we sometimes refer to as CIFRA, um, basically to bring it into conformity with the FMLA. There are some differences. We will discuss some of those today. But largely, those two laws operate in a similar fashion and operate from similar, if not the same, definitions. And then that was it for a long time, until 2008. Now, so far we've been talking about family um, rights, uh, family and medical leave, pregnancy leave, and then we come to 2008 National Defense Authorization Act. Um, that should stick out to you a little bit. Um, and the reason that the National Defense Authorization Act um, expanded family leaves on the federal level is because at the time, and still today, we were fighting wars in two different theaters. Um, largely with um, members of the military who, who were there because they were called up from either the National Guard or the Reserves. And uh, Congress recognized that that put a lot of strain on military families. And so established two new types of FMLA leave for military families, and we'll talk about a little bit more about those later. And then finally, in 2012, California um, enacted some expansions of pregnancy leave rights through two bills that, that passed actually in 2011, um, SB 299, which um, will give um, somebody who is disabled by pregnancy up to 16 weeks of, um, of, um, ben of protected benefits. 
and AB 592, which makes it an illegal employment practice for an employer to interfere with the employee's right to pregnancy disability leave. So, what are the basics? Well, the FMLA provides certain employees with up to 12 work weeks of unpaid job protected leave in a 12 month period for specified family and medical reasons. The employees who are eligible for this leave are ones who have been employed for at least 12 months and have worked 1,250 hours during the 12 months prior to the start of the leave. I'll note here that full-time teachers and exempt employees are deemed to meet this test, so you don't have to apply that test to your exempt employees or to full-time teachers. Um, employee, um, to be eligible for a Family and Medical Leave Act leave, the employee must work in a location where 50 or more employees are located within 75 sur surface road miles of each other. And then this last bullet says not a key employee. Now technically, a key employee actually can take an FMLA leave. The important part is that they are not entitled to job protection while they're on that leave. So let's just go through this very briefly and we'll touch on this again later. Who is a key employee? Key employees are salaried employees among the highest 10% of all salaried employees employed by the employer within 75 miles of the work site. To be a key employee, the employer would have to suffer a substantial and grievous economic injury by allowing that employee to be reinstated to their job at the end of the leave. Um, because of that, there are really very few key employees, um, probably even fewer in the public agency context. And there are some written notice requirements um, with regard to designating somebody a key employee as well. So um, key employees really are the exception and not the rule. Now, what are some of the basic leave provisions under FMLA? Well, leave is unpaid. That said, there are many ways to get paid during an FMLA leave, including um, disability insurance, vacation time, and other ways, but the FMLA itself does not provide for paid leave. The restoration of the job and benefits are protected. It provides for up to 12 work weeks during any 12-month period of leave. Um, spouses employed by the same employer may be limited to a total of 12 work weeks to, for leave taken to bond with a new child. Employers or employees may choose to run concurrently any accrued paid leave, like sick leave or vacation leave, subject to the terms and conditions of the employer's normal leave policy. Now before we go through the last bullet, let me stop here and talk to you for a minute about the employer's normal leave policy. We believe that it is important for employers to develop and, and have and maintain a, a written leave policy. Um, because it's, it's easier for everybody to be working from the same set of notes, um, for the people who are administering leaves to have a place that they could go um, to get answers, and for employees to know exactly what the expectations are. Um, there are certain choices that employers can make in having a leave policy, whether to run sick or vacation time concurrently with a, with, a, with a leave, with a protected leave, whether to run different kinds of protective leave con concurrently if you can. Um, there, are, there are a number of choices that an employer can make. It's important that the employer provides these choices, um, it, 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 you know, provides its answers to these choices in an upfront manner with an employee and that they are consistent in applying them. And so for those reasons, we really think that the best policy is to have a written leave policy that you can refer to. Back to my last bullet. In California, for serious health conditions of a family member, the employee can choose to use up to one half of their annual accrued sick time to take care of that person, and that's actually protected under California Labor Code Section 233. Now again, before we get into our questions, I just want to talk to you about the basics of administering leave laws, and, and so how do you go through this analysis? Well, the floor, as you can see on this pyramid, is the federal law. That is the minimum that you are required to provide. 
the federal law provides that if state law provides for additional benefits more than the federal law provides, then you apply the state law in that instance. So on top of federal law, we have California, the California Labor Code, the California Government Code, and for educational institutions, the California Education Code, which gives additional rights to, um, to some, uh, some school employees. And then finally, on top of that, we have collective bargaining rights. But I would even broaden that to call that really agreements between employees and employers. So any, um, anything that you as an employer have agreed to in writing that's over and above what the federal law and the state law provides, you have to look to that as well when administering a leave. So with all of that as background, um, we come to our first question. Yes, and Amy, I just want to jump in on your point earlier about written agreements between employers and employees. You know, sure. you can have a written agreement that is a policy and procedure manual, but you could also have a written agreement that is in an email. So it's really, really important to recognize that anything you put in writing on this topic can ultimately be considered a guideline or a precedent. Right. Right. And, and the other reason to have a written leave policy is to incorporate everything that you've agreed to in writing in one place. Very true. So now that we have a basic outline of what laws we have to comply with, let's talk about the timing. So exactly when are we required to give someone a leave of absence? Okay. Well, I've uh, put together this chart, hopefully, to make this a simple analysis for most of you. Again, we're looking at a couple of different laws and also at collective bargaining. So let's start with what's required under both federal and state law, under FMLA and CIFRA. Um, you have to give somebody a leave if they are qualified for a leave um, when they're, uh, upon the birth of their child, upon the placement of a child with the employee for adoption or foster care, to care for the child, spouse, or parent um, with a serious health condition, for the employee's own serious health condition, and um, under California law, pregnancy disability leave, also if the employee is disabled by pregnancy, childbirth, or a related medical condition. That's actually carved out to the pregnancy disability leave law in California. Um, and that said, all of that is, is assumed within the FMLA so that, and we'll talk about this a little bit more later, FMLA and pregnancy disability leave can and often do run concurrently with each other. There are two other kinds of federally protected leave. There's the qualifying exigency leave for family members of reservists and members of the National Guard. And there's also leave to care for the child, spouse, parent, or next of kin of a covered service member. Finally, again, you have to look to um, whatever is, is uh, contained within your collective bargaining agreements or other agreements with employees regarding when you are required to give somebody a leave. Well, qualifying exigency is kind of a mouthful. I challenge anybody to say that three times fast. I think we need some definitions. Sure. Um, before we get to qualifying exigency, there are actually a couple of other definitions I wanted to talk about. Um, and the first is serious health condition. So a serious health condition is an illness, injury, impairment, or physical or mental condition that involves either inpatient care in a hospital, hospice, or residential medical facility, or continuing treatment by a health care provider. Now, continuing treatment has a really long definition, actually, and, and there are a whole set of regulations on what qualifies and doesn't qualify as continuing treatment. Um, within the confines of 50 minutes, we don't have the time to go into that today, but basically it comes out to incapacity and treatment, treatment for chronic conditions like asthma, treatment for permanent or long-term conditions, um, treatment for conditions requiring multiple treatments. Continuing on with the definitions, and, and so that I answer Cynthia's question, with regard to the military leave, a qualifying exigency leave is only available for family members of military reservists and National Guard members that are either on active duty or that are called to active duty. And it makes sense when you look at um, what a qualifying exigency is. 
it is, according to the regulations, short notice deployment, military events and related activities, child care and school activities, financial and legal arrangements, counseling, rest and recuperation, post-deployment activities, additional act and, and additional activities by the agreement of the employer and the employee. Um, I'll note here that these are really all, for the most part, short-term needs for leave. Um, so you're looking at leave requests that will probably be intermittent in nature. Um, and this is something that is an open-ended list. So it is an area where you as an employer really need to engage in a process with the employee in discussing what their needs are. Finally, a covered service member for the covered service member leave is a member of the armed services who is undergoing medical treatment, recuperation, or therapy, is otherwise in outpatient status, or is otherwise on the temporary disability retired list for a serious injury or illness incurred in the line of duty. Well, these are a lot of different reasons for leave, and I assume that we have to communicate these to the employee. How do they find out about leaves they're entitled to, and how do they go about requesting leave? Mm -hmm. So the first thing you need to know is that you're required um, under federal law to, um, to have uh, posted the um, employer, employee rights and responsibilities under the FMLA uh, in a spot where your employees can see it. So we've provided a, um, just a, a picture of that poster as well as a link to the Department of Labor website where you can download a copy of the poster. Um, and then employees have to let you know um, when they need a leave. So under the FMLA, if a need, if, if the need for leave is foreseeable, the employee is supposed to provide you at least 30 days notice of the need for a leave. If they provide you with less than 30 days notice, you can ask them why it wasn't practicable for them to give you a full 30 days notice. If the need for the leave is not foreseeable, or if there was a change in circumstances, then the notice must be provided as soon as practicable. So what does that mean? Well, the federal regulations say that this means within two days of when the need for a leave becomes known to the employee. But a comment to the regulations is that they expect that this would happen either the same day or the next business day. Now, once, you, once an employee gives you notice, of the need for leave. Um, there are two notices that you must send out as an employer within five days. Um, this is the first one, the Notice of Eligibility, Rights, and Responsibilities. And this is the second one, the Designation Notice. It's your, it's your responsibility as an employer to designate a leave as qualifying for FMLA and CIFRA or any other leave law. Um, and this, again, must go out within two, five business days of the employee's notice of a need um, to take a leave. Um, we've provided links, again, on both pages to those forms on the Department of Labor website. Okay, so we know why and we know when we're going to give a lead. So I think it's time to kind of wade in the weeds. And, of course, medical benefits are the biggest issue, although we will find out that they're not the only benefits you may want to consider. Mm -hmm. And the most common issue is who pays and when, and when does COBRA apply? This is a whole basket full of questions, Amy. Yeah, and this is the basket full of questions that we hear most often um, as, as benefits consultants. So let's, um, let's start into it. Under the FMLA, employers are required, and actually this is true under CIFRA as well, to maintain coverage under any group health plan, and that's medical, dental, or vision, for up to 12 work weeks per 12-month period at the same level and conditions as active employees. That means, as an employer, if you've been paying a portion of your employee's premium, you are required during that 12-week, 12 12-work-week 12 period to continue to pay your portion of the premium for those medical benefits. Now, employers may also continue non-health benefits for what we refer to as administrative ease. Um, and actually, there are a couple of, even though you're not required to do this, there are a couple of really good reasons to continue these benefits. And Cynthia, I think, um, I think I'll defer to you on this one, so to explain why and what benefits we're talking about. 
Okay, Amy. Well, as Amy mentioned, the only coverage you're required to maintain is the group medical coverage. A lot of people don't realize that includes dental and vision. But most of you are also paying premiums for the group life and AD&D coverage for these employees, and some have group income protection programs in place as well. Now, you don't have to maintain these by law, but there's some very good reasons why you'd want to. And first of all, it's an extra administrative hassle to track turning off a benefit and turning it back on when someone returns. Secondly, most of these group programs limit enrollment to new hires, so it would be against the contract rules to drop someone one for two or three months and then re-enroll them. And then thirdly, if you drop them, you could trigger an insurance carrier requirement for a health exam, a waiting period, or even a pre-existing exclusion. And as you'll see when we discuss return from leave, this conflicts with the federal and state law requirements. The portion of the premium that's attributable to one individual in life in AD&D or group income protection is so low, it's not really a cost issue. So we would recommend that you keep people on those programs for administrative ease rather than incurring the problems involved when you try to turn it on and off. Thanks, Cynthia. Um, as I mentioned before, under CIFRA, the rules are the same as they are under the FMLA. Under pregnancy disability leave, we have a new rule that went into effect um, on uh, January 1st of this year. And that is that the employer must continue health care coverage for up to 16 weeks of pregnancy disability leave under the same terms and conditions as if the employee had been continuously working during that time. Um, the requirement prior to this year was for only 12 weeks. Um, they added, the, um, the California legislature added the extra four weeks, I think, to make sure that somebody who's taking a pregnancy disability leave has coverage available for the entire time of that leave, should it be necessary. So one of the questions we get all the time is who pays for this? And as I said before, the employer has to continue its share of the premium um, during, the, during the time of the protected leave. That said, the employee must also continue to pay his or her share of the premium and must do so within 30 days of the due date or the coverage can be dropped by the employer. Now, to drop coverage, an employer must send the notice once premium is 15 days late. Um, and if an employer pays the premiums during the time of the leave, they can actually recover the premiums paid from an employee who doesn't return from the leave. That is, unless the employee doesn't return because they have a serious health condition or because, of their, because there are circumstances beyond the control of the employee. Um, those are two big exceptions. We do know that, that there are some employers that are successful in recovering um, their share of premiums paid out when a, an employee um, fails to return from the leave. One further note on this. If the if, if an if a employee takes a pregnancy disability leave and then immediately afterward takes a CIFRA leave, you as an employer cannot recover the premium unless the employee doesn't return from the CIFRA leave. And as a matter of fact, you should not um, try to recover premium until the employee has exhausted um, their, their benefit protected leave. Yes, it's interesting, Amy. We've talked to a lot of employers, and some of them pursue this aggressively. Some of them don't pursue it at all. I mm -hmm. guess uh, it's the important thing to remember is that if you do start if you do decide to pursue it you need to pursue it from everyone. Mm -hmm. And if you don't pursue it uh, and you're going to start pursuing it you should probably uh make sure you have that change in your written policies and procedures. That's right. And yeah, and 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 like so much of of what we're going to say today those decisions need to be made really in a consistent manner. Um, and, and with something like recovery of premium paid, I would also advise employers to let employees know at the beginning of a leave that they will seek recovery of premiums that they paid if the, if, if the employee does not return from the leave. Um, this can be done with a cover letter on top of your designation notice. 
um, explaining the, you know, that and anything else that's different about your particular leave policy. Um, so, so just, again, so that everybody's operating off of the same set of rules and there are no surprises. So um, we talked about um, employees being required to continue their portion of, of health premiums. So um, what are your options um, as an employer for how to collect that premium? Well, you have a number of options. Again, um, you should probably set out the ones that you want to make available to employees in your written leave policy. But you can make them due at the same time as if you were doing it by a payroll deduction, or make them due on the same schedule used for COBRA premiums. You can make it available um, to employees an option to prepay under a cafeteria plan. Or you can use the other rules that you apply for leaves without pay. That said, what you can't do is require prepayment or require a higher contribution than if the employee continued um, to be at the job. You can also come up with another voluntary arrangement agreement between you as an employer and the employee, which could in include prepayment if FMLA leave is foreseeable. You just can't require that. Um, I know there are employers that actually wait until the employee returns from leave and then debits the amount of premium that they paid in the interim from the first two or three pay periods. Um, certainly as an employer, you take on that risk when you do that, um, that you will be seeking, uh, if an employee doesn't return from leave, you'll be seeking not only the portions that you paid um, of, of your part of the premium, but also the employee's part of premium. Some employers may not wish to take on that risk. Other employers have found that this works out nicely. So I think with that, we're also going to talk about COBRA. Cynthia? Cynthia, did you want to say a couple of words? <laughs> I wanted to, I had my mute on, sorry about that. Okay. All right, so when do you offer COBRA? The basic thing to remember about COBRA is that it com becomes available when an employee loses health coverage due to either termination or when reduced hours make the employee ineligible for benefits. Now, neither of these conditions apply to FMLA because you are, of course, not losing your benefits. So FMLA leave, taking FMLA leave, and we are including CIFRA and the FLA, FMLA leave, is not a qualifying event for COBRA. But failure to return from FMLA leave is a qualifying event for COBRA because that would be a termination. So when does the termination occur? If the employee does not return to work, then the COBRA qualifying event occurs on the last day of FMLA leave. So that would be officially the COBRA qualifying event day. If the employee paid their premiums to continue their benefit during FMLA leave, uh, pardon me, if the employer paid the, benefit, the premiums to continue the benefit during FMLA leave, you cannot condition COBRA continuation upon repayment of premiums. You can ask to recover those premiums, but you can't refuse COBRA to someone because they, have, because they haven't repaid the premiums that they should have paid during that FMLA or CIFRA leave. That's right. COBRA is a separate right and can't be dependent on, on FMLA. Exactly. So I think at this point it's time to discuss the length of the leaves and especially how multiple laws can create multiple leave links, which is the most confusing part. Okay, thanks, Cynthia. And um, hopefully this chart um, will give you, uh, again, one place to look for the answer to this question. Although, as you'll see when we get into pregnancy leaves, it, it can get a little bit more complicated. Let's go through it. So FMLA and CIFRA for the basic family leaves to take care of an ill family member, seriously ill family member um, for your own serious injury or illness, um, for, um, for pregnancy and childbirth generally, um, you get, the employee would get um, 12 work weeks of leave within a 12 month period. And again, California carves out pregnancy disability leave, so a woman who is disabled by pregnancy or childbirth 
is entitled to 16 work weeks of protected leave during a 12-month period. Um, there is also under the federal law qualifying exigency leave, that is the leave taken by a family member of someone who's called up um, out of the National Guard or the Reserves. That also, that person is also entitled to 12, up to 12 work weeks of leave during a 12 month period. The interesting one is covered service member leave. A, an employee who needs to take a leave to take care of a covered service member who is injured or ill can have up to 26 work weeks of leave within a 12 month period. Now, a person using this kind of leave um, can also use other FMLA leaves during the same 12-month period. So, for instance, if it's the wife of um, of somebody who of somebody who is injured, um, say in Iraq or Afghanistan, that woman could have had a um, you know a, a pregnancy leave um, or, or a bonding leave of 12 weeks earlier that year she would still have an additional 14 weeks of leave available to take care of the injured service member spouse. So the maximum number of work weeks that that person can have during any 12-month period is 26 work weeks, but it can be split among two different kinds of leave. Okay, well, before we go any farther, you've mentioned several times that there are new California rules for pregnancy leave. So can we go into that a little bit more? Yeah, and, be and before we get into the new rules, actually, let's talk about the old rules um, because pregnancy leaves are, are an area where we get a lot of confusion and a lot of questions, and certainly they're a very common kind of leave under federal and state law. So let's just sort of review what the leave of rights availability is for women um, who are pregnant and having children. There's pregnancy disability leave which applies to employers with five or more employees. There is no time and service requirement, so a person, can, an employee, can take a pregnancy disability leave even if they've only been working for the employer for a short period of time. It entitles that person disabled by pregnancy to up to four months of leave um, if they are disabled by pregnancy, childbirth, or a related medical condition and pregnancy disability leave can be taken intermittently. It can also run concurrently with an FMLA leave, but not with a CIFRA leave. And we'll talk a little bit more about why that is later. Under the Family and Medical Leave Act, um, employers um, with 50 or more employees are subject to FMLA. The employees who are entitled to FMLA leave are those that have worked 1,250 hours in the prior 12-month period, with exceptions for exempt employees and instructional employees of schools. Um, again, FMLA allows up to 12 weeks of leave for the birth of a child, and that includes leave before childbirth if the woman is unable to work due to her pregnancy. Now, technically, FMLA can't be taken intermittently, but practically, because it almost always runs concurrently with either pregnancy disability leave, which can be taken intermittently, or CIFRA, which also can be taken intermittently, often a person will be taking an FMLA leave uh, for pregnancy that actually she can take intermittently because the California law that's running concurrently allows her greater rights than the federal law. And again, FMLA can run concurrently with both pregnancy disability leave or CIFRA. Finally, there's um, the California Family Rights Act, which applies in the same manner as the, as the federal family leave law, but allows up to 12 weeks of leave to bond with a new child. That is, under most circumstances, CIFRA um, only applies to a woman having a baby after the baby is born. Now, it can be taken intermittently, and it can run concurrently with FMLA, but not with pregnancy disability leave. Well, Amy, I wish you could see my chat board because it is absolutely <laughs> overflowing with questions. <laughs> and while the chart helps, it's really hard to see it as a whole. So I'm really glad it looks like you've got an example we can look at. Okay. And actually, you know, I'm looking at this example, and this, this poor woman delivered at 42 weeks. I feel sorry for her. Um, more, more typically, you'll see somebody deliver at 40 weeks. 
Um, but this generally, let's go through sort of what happens during a typical pregnancy. So at 34 weeks, um, with six weeks left to go in her pregnancy, this woman um, becomes disabled due to her pregnancy and unable to work. She is eligible for FMLA at that point, for a leave protected by the Family uh, Medical Leave Act. She's also um, eligible for pregnancy disability leave under California law. This employer has chosen to run both concurrently, which, uh, is, which is something we recommend. So she begins her FMLA leave and her pregnancy disability leave at the same time at 34 weeks. Let's just say that she delivers at well, we'll take, we'll say she delivers at 40 weeks. So she's used six weeks of FMLA leave, six weeks of pregnancy disability leave. Under the FMLA, she has another six weeks available to her. Under pregnancy, pregnancy disability leave, she has another 10 weeks available to her. She, at, at the point where she delivers, may very well still be disabled by the delivery of that child for an additional usually six to eight weeks. So let's say she takes an additional six weeks at that point. Um, she will have run out her FMLA leave at the end of that six weeks. She may still have an additional um, four weeks of pregnancy disability leave left to her, but she at, you know, at, at six weeks out after delivery is no longer disabled by the birth of that child. When she is no longer disabled by the birth of the child, then, under California law, she has 12 weeks of bonding leave available to her under CIFRA, and she can choose to take all of those 12 weeks at once or to take them intermittently. This one will have taken them all at once. So the leave will have begun at 34 weeks, but will run for 24 weeks. Okay, well, you say that's a typical pregnancy, but I don't believe that Many, everyone has a typical pregnancy. Can we look at a, a more complicated example? Sure. So this is a more complicated example, and, and also I don't know why delivery is at 50 weeks here, but, but let's just run through it. Let's just pretend that little D isn't there, and we'll, we'll go on from, from there. So this woman um, has a complication early in her pregnancy. She becomes disabled at 12 weeks into the pregnancy, so she's only three months pregnant when she becomes disabled, unable to work for a period of time. Um, she is entitled at that moment to 12 weeks of FMLA and 16 weeks of pregnancy disability leave. Again, this employer runs those two kinds of leaves concurrently. So from, um, from 12 weeks through 24 weeks of pregnancy, um, she is covered by the FMLA. From 12 weeks through um, 20, I'm trying to do math in my head, never a good thing for a lawyer. So 12 weeks plus 16 weeks till 28 weeks of her pregnancy, she's covered by pregnancy disability leave. At 28 weeks pregnant, this poor woman is still disabled by the condition that disabled her at 12 weeks. So what does she do? She's not normally entitled to, to a sick for leave because under the California Family Rights Act, um, that leave is available for bonding with a new child, but she won't have a new child to bond with until she's delivered the child at 40 weeks. So she's got 12 weeks of gap there. What could happen and what, um, what the regulations in California allow an employer to do is to begin a CIFRA leave early if the employee's doctor determines that the continuation of the leave is medically necessary. So this employer can, during that gap, allow the employee to fill in the gap with CIFRA. There may also be other leaves available under other leave policies there um, at, at any given employer. But you can, under this narrow circumstance, start a CIFRA leave early. Now, this employee is still only entitled to 12 weeks of CIFRA leave. So if there's some other way of filling this gap, the employee takes that time, the, they may, she may, have that 12 weeks of CIFRA leave available to her after she delivers the baby. And Amy, before we move on from this slide, I think there's really two important points to emphasize. One is we've been talking about running FMLA and, and, and pregnancy disability leave concurrently, mm -hmm. and that is definitely what we recommend because it, it, is, it assists the employer in planning for how long the absence is going to be. It's, um, it's allowed by the law. 
it's not required by the law and then and we do we are aware of some employers who choose to run them separately which is mm-hmm. very generous uh, but can cause other problems and then right. And so that that's one thing I wanted to emphasize. And the other thing I wanted to emphasize is where you're talking about where the employer has the option to run CIFRA earlier if the doctor provides the uh, the medical reason for doing that. And that would be something really, really important to be documented. Agreed. Yes. So with all that as background, what are the new rules for pregnancy and childbirth weeks uh, leaves in California? The first one we've already discussed. You must continue health insurance coverage for up to 16 weeks of pregnancy disability leave. There's also a new definition of disabled by pregnancy, which includes under the regulations severe morning sickness, the need for time off for pre- or postnatal care, bed rest, gestational diabetes, pregnancy-induced hypertension, preeclampsia, postpartum depression, childbirth, loss or end of the pregnancy or recovery from childbirth, loss or end of the pregnancy. Um, That's a long list. It's not exclusive. Um, The regulations say it is merely illustrative. So there may very well be other conditions that disable a woman, um, that make her disabled by pregnancy and um, give her the right to a pregnancy disability leave. Um, One of the areas that's being much discussed right now is lactation because lactation is certainly included in in some of the regulations as a um, as an, as a as an, um, a condition that women can get when uh, you know after pregnancy. Um, it's not generally considering considered disabling to the point where a person um, would be entitled to um, to a leave from work. However, there are conditions of lactation like mastitis, other infections, that may very well disable a woman by pregnancy. So again, this this list is um, not exclusive, and this is something where you're probably going to want a certification from a physician. Um, There's also a new definition of four months for pregnancy disability leave. It it seems kind of silly. You'd think that we all know what four months means, but... As a matter of fact, this has been a source of great confusion under the Pregnancy Disability Leave Law for years now, and so these regulations are welcome. The new definition um, says that four months is the number of days the employee would normally work within four calendar months, that is 17 and a third weeks, if the leave were taken continuously. Now, if the employee's schedule varies varies by month, as an employer, you can use a monthly average of the hours worked over the four months prior to the beginning of the leave to calculate what four months is for that employee. And that becomes especially crucial if you're looking at a leave that's taken intermittently so that you're you're going to have to be tracking the number of hours of leave that person has taken. Well, okay. Um, We've covered a lot about the period of the leave itself. Now let's talk a little bit about the return to work. So what are our obligations to the employee when once the leave is over? Okay. Well, under both FMLA and CIFRA, um, as an employer, you have a reinstatement obligation. The employee must be reinstated to the same or to an equivalent position. Now, what's an equivalent position? Well, it's one that has the same pay, benefits, and working conditions, the same privileges, perquisites, and status, and the same or substantially similar duties and responsibilities entailing substantially equivalent skills, effort, responsibility, and authority. It might not be the same job, but it's pretty darn close to it. Um, There is, however, no requirement to hold the position open if the employee has stated to you that he or she does not wish to return. That said, that is something that, as an employer, I would get from that employee in writing. Either confirm it in a letter to the employee saying, we had this conversation on this date, you told us you're not coming back, we are no longer holding your position open because of that statement, or um, requesting that that employee send you a letter saying that they are no longer returning to work. Um, and, and that they understand that they will not, you know, that you are no longer holding the job open for them because of that. It's important as a risk management tool 
so that if this employee um, changes their mind later on or if there was a misunderstanding, um, you're not in a position where you're being sued for, um, for failing to reinstate them. Now, there are some defenses to reinstatement. The first one is, I think, um, re especially relevant right now, and, and that is the unavailability of the position. If there's been a reduction in force, for instance, um, or a reorganization, and that position is no longer there, you don't have to reinstate that employee. If the person is a key employee, as we discussed before, you are not required to reinstate him or her if it would cause a gr grievous harm to the economic condition of the company. Again, um, that's, I think, fairly rare. Um, you can also require a release from the person's medical provider that they are no longer disabled and that they are able to return to work. If you're going to do this, you should do this as part of a policy of doing this for everybody who comes back from a leave, and it should be part of your written leave policy. And finally, this may go out without saying, but there is a 12-week limit for leave, and the leave must be taken for a permissible purpose. So you do not have to reinstate somebody who has taken more than the leave that is protected by law. And you do not have to reinstate somebody if they have taken leave under false pretenses. Two more things on return to work. Seniority does not need to accrue um, during a leave under FMLA or CIFRA. That said, remember the pyramid I showed you at the beginning of the hour. Um, you have to also look at, um, at state laws that may govern you as an employer and at your collective bargaining agreements. They may say something different about seniority, and if that's the case, you have to apply what, is, what gives the greatest rights to the employee. So just because FMLA and CIFRA don't require seniority to accrue during leave, that's not the end of your analysis, it's really just the beginning. Upon return from a leave, if the insurance coverage has, has lapsed for that employee, you as an employer are required to re return to restore the employee to their benefits with no pre-existing condition exclusions, no waiting period, and no health exam. This goes to what Cynthia was saying before about um, continuing non-health benefits for administrative ease. Um, because there are certain kinds of benefits, um, life insurance, long-term disability, that may require um, waiting periods or health exams or other, other conditions prior to restoration of benefits, it may be much easier for you to continue those benefits while somebody's on a leave than to allow them to lapse. Two more considerations on return to work. And, um, and we're going to talk just briefly right now about the Americans with Disabilities Act. The employee who has taken this leave may be entitled to more than their 12 weeks of unpaid leave as a reasonable accommodation under the ADA or under FEHA if this person is still disabled under the definitions contained in those laws. Um, and in fact, um, the areas where a person needs, may need a reasonable accommodation has been expanded by the same regulations we talked about before for women affected by pregnancy. Um, so you have to be very careful at the end of a leave if, if a person is still claiming to be disabled um, or affected by a pregnancy, you may need to make a reasonable accommodation that can include more unpaid leave at that time. And at this point, it's also important to note that most of these things are involve the investigation of facts and circumstances and medical certifications. And really the details of that should be discussed with your legal advisor. Mm -hmm. Agreed. All right, well here's an item that's been in the news a lot. As you know, California has its own laws about same-sex spouses and domestic partners. And of course, we're all hearing about changes in other states and possible action by the Supreme Court on the federal level. So what about same-sex spouses and domestic partners? Okay, Susie. Well, as you noted, this is an area of the law where there's the potential for a lot of flux in the next year, and we just found out um, that last week the Supreme Court has agreed to hear um, challenges to Prop 8 as well as uh, challenges to the Defense of Marriage Act. So we may see a great deal of change on this 
um, it's probably next spring around the end of June. But let's talk about what the law provides currently. A spouse is defined under the FMLA as a husband or wife under state law. However, and this is a big however, the Defense of Marriage Act, the federal law, does not apply to same-sex, um, it does not allow the application of the FMLA to same-sex partners. Um, so therefore, um, a, a domestic partner or a same-sex spouse would not qualify um, for an FMLA leave to take care of their same-sex partner or spouse. However, under, uh, under um, guidance that was issued by the Department of Labor in 2010, a clarification has been issued that, um, that a person can take an FMLA leave to take care of the children of that person's same-sex partner if you are basically acting in loco parentis for that child, if you've assumed responsibility um, to act as a parent for that child, then it doesn't matter that they're not your biological child, that they're the child of your same-sex partner. You're still entitled to take an FMLA leave to care for that child if that child becomes ill. CIFRA is easier. Um, it's state law. And CIFRA applies to domestic partners and same-sex spouses. And All that. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say, and as we've emphasized before, if the state gives more generous benefits than the federal, then you have to follow the state law. Yes, but you cannot apply a, you know, a, 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 under any circumstances an FMLA leave um, uh, to same-sex spouses to care for each other. It's right. Just that that piece has been um, has been carved out by DOMA since I think 1996. Um, and again, unless DOMA is overturned by the Supreme Court this year, that, that is currently the law of the land. Um, I just wanted to say one more thing, since we are talking about benefits today. Keep in mind that the same rules that apply to, um, to the tax treatment of benefits under normal circumstances would apply during an FMLA leave. So the taxation of benefits will be different under state law than it is under federal law. Well, one thing we haven't talked about is workers' compensation, and we, while we're focusing on the employee benefits side in this webinar, we should touch on what happens when employees are on leave for work-related injuries. Yeah, and in seven minutes, we're not going to, to do much touching on it. Um, this is an area, actually, um, where the intera we could spend hours on the interaction of, of these laws with, um, with workers' compensation laws. and. Um, so we're just going to provide a couple of quick guidelines on this. And they are as follows. follows. FMLA and CIFRA may run concurrently with, um, with leave under a workers, uh, because the person has been injured and, and they are in the workers' compensation system. The employee or the workers' comp claims administrator may provide notice of a serious health condition. So as a, as a um, leave administrator, you may actually get the notice of the serious health condition from the comp claims administrator and not necessarily from the employee first. Um, FMLA and CIFRA eligibility is independent of the workers' comp claim decision. This is important. So it may be pending or you may uh, delay or deny a claims decision on workers' compensation. That has no bearing on whether this employee is eligible for FMLA or CIFRA leave. And so you have to do those two analyses independently of each other. And finally, the employer determines FMLA and CIFRA eligibility and provides the notice, and that's the same as it is without a workers' compensation claim pending. Okay, well, so far we've talked about the laws that apply to everyone, but we know that there are some special rules for certain types of employees. Right. So, um, so, and, and I may have touched on this earlier. If I didn't, I was remiss. Um, for public employers, really the only difference is that um, you are deemed to be covered by FMLA regardless of your size. Um, for healthcare providers, there really are no special rules um, particular to your industry. The only really developed set of special rules by industry under FMLA are for K through 12 schools, and we're just going to spend a minute on these. So there are a few rules for what they call instructional employees of schools, and that's largely teachers at K through 12 institutions. 
The first one is that full-time instructional employees of schools are deemed to meet the time and service requirement. We already discussed that earlier. The rest of the rules reflect the need to strike a balance between the needs of pupils and the needs of teachers. So the first one is breaks don't count. And this, this actually occurs across the board, not just to teachers, but it applies often in the teachers in the teaching context. Um, so basically, you get a certain number of work weeks of leave, um, weeks that aren't work weeks for your organization, either because you work for a factory that closes for a period of time, or because you work for a school that breaks over the summer, don't count against your leave. So an, a teacher can start a leave at the end of a session and still have leave time available to him or to her at the beginning of the next session. Leave is somewhat flexible for employers. If, um, if the request for leave is, in, is for intermittent leave or for a reduced schedule, and the employee would be absent over 20% of the working days in that school period, the employer may require either leave of a particular duration or a temporary transfer to another position. Now, there's a whole complicated set of rules here about, um, about that, and I'm not going to get into that in any detail, but just know that that exists for somebody who would be absent over 20% of working days in a period. Again, there's a whole complicated set of rules under, about the end of leave taken at the end of a term. What you need to know today is that depending on the timing of the leave and the reason for the leave, the employer may require the employee to continue the leave to the end of the term, and that is not take a leave that, that ends three weeks before the end of the term and then come back. And I think, again, the reasoning behind that is the disruption that would exist in the classroom. Um, the Department of Labor actually has all of the regulations on this on their website, and we have that address listed here in the presentation. Well, as we said at the beginning of this webinar, it would be impossible to cover everything we needed to cover in 50 minutes. So you're probably wondering where you're going to be able to go to get answers that you need now. So we're going to show you a couple of the important places to go. One is our Keenan briefings on the Keenan.com website. And whenever there is a topic that is of particular interest to our clients, we usually issue a briefing on that. And so we want to direct you to that area. There are also three special websites where there are uh, there is a lot more detailed information. The first one is a California website for the Fair Employment Housing Commission, which governs these laws in California, and that's a very valuable website. The second is the EDD website because the specifically California a paid family leave and uh, come under there, and that is an FAQ that can be very, very valuable to you. The last website is the DOL.gov website, which is a great place to go for your specific FMLA questions. So those are some valuable websites that I would recommend to you. Now, at this point, uh, this is when we would normally have our question period. And I have kind of a dilemma here because we are at pretty much at the time limit of our webinar. And I did get an enormous number of questions. I think I've got at least 30 questions in this list. So we're obviously not going to have time to get to those. What I will promise you is that since we weren't able to answer your questions in person today, we are going to prepare an FAQ list that we will make available. Several people had questions about getting copies of the presentation, and I apologize for your printing problems. I can't really help you with those remotely, but what I can tell you is that within the next seven days, and hopefully sooner, we will have the recording posted on our website, we will have the presentation posted on our website for you to download, and we will be working on a list of FAQs to, to circulate to everyone who attended the webinar. So at this point, we'd like to thank you for your attention and tell you how much we appreciate it. Please let us know what else you'd like to have, and we will make sure that all of these items are posted for your information within the next week.